Okay, so welcome to LASP. I uh, gave a talk when I quit teaching three years ago after 25 years of teaching uh, about the demographics of the field of astrophysical and planetary sciences. That was the name of the department. And uh, since then, I've actually been going around the US giving talks about demographics in various situations, partly as part of a review panel, reviewing a department, reviewing an institution, or as um, uh, just to, to give a seminar on the issue of demographics. So I've been following the issue of demographics for some time, and I just thought I would share it with you so you get a sense of demographics. And we're going to go the gamut, um, starting off with international view, and then we'll zoom in to the national view here at the US, and then locally, as local as our own institution of LASP. And I hope to give you a sense of where the demographics are changing, where there are changes in the demographics as we go down through that uh, in the, the different situations. And of course, think about how to fix them. Now, we can't fix international issues much that we might like to. Um, so we can only act locally. So uh, that's what the international about the US. That's what the, everybody wants to fix the larger situation. But I think we've got plenty of things here at home at our own institutions to fix before we get there. Um, I've got a big acronym soup here of organizations. These are our professional organizations for the scientists and engineers. Uh, the main one is the American Institute of Physics, which is an umbrella organization uh, under which things like the AGU, the AAS, and, and so on all belong. And our field of planetary, space physics, uh, solar physics, and uh, uh, astronomy, and so on all fit within that. But the most important is the one that I've highlighted here, which is the statistical division of the AIP. Those are the pros that know how to do surveys and are very good at doing studies of demographics. And a lot of the material I'll be showing to you comes from their website. Okay, so let's start off, think about statistics. And the answer, of course, is buyer beware here because you never really know where the stats come from when you're looking at these plots. But I came across this one from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Pretty big organization, should be important, right? So the numbers must be right. So this is percentage of women aged 25 to 54 who are employed. And the years go from 2000 to 2013. And what was pretty dramatic that I saw here is that the US, the numbers have been dropping. And in Japan, they've been rising doubly. So what's going on? I mean, very, very rapidly. Um, so first we have to look at the numbers, and then there's the interpretation. Why? Oh, this must mean that such and such and such and such, right? Well, it, it, you know, who knows? Uh, but also be careful, because there's a lot being revealed here, or maybe, you know, how trustworthy are the numbers, or what's gone into these numbers and how they interpret them. So for example, I've been showing this graph several times, and then I heard on a podcast recently, so it must be true, right, NPR, that um, in these Japanese numbers, a lot of those women are actually part-time and not very well paid. So you have to be careful, by beware. Now I'm going to talk a bit about gender and issues related to gender demographics or the demographics of gender, uh, but they apply uh, across areas across genders and the, the, the all sorts of other issues are involved. The reason why I, I do this is that I found in reviewing institutions and talking about institutions that the canaries are often, the, the women are often the canaries in the mine. That is, they, are, they sniff out where there are issues and their behavior is often an indicator of general issues that need to be paid attention to. So, although I focus on gender, this isn't the sole issue. I want you to keep thinking bigger uh, about these issues. So let's start with an international view. And here we are, we have uh, from the AIP um, a, a, a compilation of the total number of bachelor's degrees in physics. And the blue numbers are physics bachelors, the red numbers are physics PhDs. 
And you can see there's a whole bunch of countries here. The US, the largest number on the left, and then a whole bunch of other numbers. Now, it's interesting that there are some important missing countries, India and China. And of course, you realize that actually getting these numbers is not easy because you have to go to the different institutions, different countries and get their numbers. And of course, what comprises a bachelor's in one country isn't necessarily going to be a bachelor's in physics in another country. So it's kind of complicated. But what I was thinking is, well, apart from what is going on in Germany, look at this amazing number of PhDs, a large fraction of their uh, bachelors, is what about the per capita numbers? You look at these in per capita, and things are radically different. Can you find the US? <laughs> it's over here, right? So all these countries over here, Greece, highest per capita, Korea, France, Taiwan, Turkey, UK, Switzerland, all of those countries, Germany, have four times more bachelors in physics produced per capita than the US. Okay, so this is an interesting cultural difference when you look at this this way. Uh, I, I, let's jump straight to LASP, because let me just go back a second. If we look at this, you can see there are a lot of countries that produce a lot per capita, particularly here Germany, there's a lot of PhDs and so on and so forth, all these country, other countries. The US, it's a really small number. Um, so then when we look at here at LASP, the research is in this, in this building, and you'll see that when you look at things like undergraduate students, grad students, and PRAs, the numbers are really pretty high in terms of US born. But when you look at those of us who have PhDs, many of us were born outside the United States. Okay, anybody else want to hold their hand up and admit that they were born outside the United States? There's 40% of the people uh, as RAs in LASP were born outside the United States. And the reason for that is, not surprisingly, when you look at the very small number of production in the US per capita, it's not surprising that a lot of us come from abroad. And if the US is going to, if LASP is going to compete in the international arena in space science, we're going to end up with a lot of foreigners uh, as scientists. Okay? So that's why there are such big differences. Um, okay, so let's do a little exercise across these countries. Which um, undergraduate physics degrees, which is, has the percentage of undergraduate physics degrees awarded to women? And we have a bunch of letters here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then we have a bunch of countries. And I want to start off with A, and I want you to hold up the number of fingers according to which country you think that one is. Go on, I have a go, just for fun. Is it one of those four? <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot of people have got four fingers up suggesting it's the US. Okay, and some other numbers. One, I see a few others, yeah. Okay, let's see G. Which country is that? We're all over the place. This is great <laughs> fun. I love this. Okay, now let's try the last one. I. This one here, the highest. Okay, okay, okay. Cool. Okay, you want the answers? Yes, of course you do. Okay. Oh. Germany, USA. India and Iran. Anybody get all four right? No. Oh, you did. Well done. Okay. So this is sort of useful because it gets you thinking. This is not what you expect. You expect very differently. And it makes you think, well, what, what, why, why? What's going on in these different places that produces different things? Similarly, look at this. Percentage of degrees going to women. Who would have expected that Turkey is the country that has the highest percentage of bachelors, nearly 40% going to women. Now, the date here is 2005, I believe. Things may have changed with the current uh, leadership in Turkey, who knows? 
um, and and may you know what they, the definitions of what these programs are and so on is interesting. But notice here, UK is here, US is here. But look what's over here, the lowest percentage is Switzerland, Germany, Netherlands, Japan, Denmark, Estonia. Would you have predicted that those European countries and Japan would have ended up down here? Right? It's not what you expect. Um, particularly these numbers really test our preconceived no notions about what's going on. Uh, yeah, why? Um, just for fun, I actually plotted, because I thought there might be something there, bachelors in physics percentage of women and bachelors in physics per million people. I don't see a whole beautiful trend there, so, you know, there's something else going on, obviously, right? In fact, what's really interesting is you look at this one, which is, uh, was published in by in the Psychological Science um, Journal uh, and they show global gender gap index which is you know basically Finland and Norway are regarded as gender uh, neutral very fair um, whereas you might expect other countries um, over here Tunisia I just picked that one out for the heck of it uh, is not necessarily being the best for gender equity and yet you look at the women percentage of women as STEM graduates there seems to be an inverse correlation. What's going on? Right? And you can invent if you know a country some reasons and explanations um, but there's something weird here this is not the standard procedure. Okay so let's look at some numbers and I'm going to go and look at these national surveys we've gone for the international to the US now and we're going to look at there are decadal surveys that are done every 10 years, right, surprise, surprise, uh, in, by the National Academy of Sciences and as the astronomy, planetary science and space physics have all had these surveys. Uh, and if you look at first at astrophysics, you'll see there they had a pretty good response. Now this is the reason why you want to employ the AIP. They get response rates to their surveys of 60 or so percent, which is really good. They know how to get good responses to their surveys. And so we now know, if we look at this, that there are on the order of 2,000 PhDs uh, working in astrophysics in the US. That is doing astrophysics research in the US. You do the same with space physics and you find that number is a bit higher, it's more like 2,300. These are people with PhDs not necessarily their PhD isn't necessarily from the US but they're working with a PhD in the US as a researcher in uh, solar space physics and up upper atmospheric research and then at the bottom is the 2011 AIP survey of planetary science that I was the chair of running that one and getting uh, working with the AIP to get that one done and we now know um, that there are about 1200 uh, PhDs in planetary science working in the US which is a pretty small number. You know, when I, I ask uh, kids, when I go and give talks about Pluto or whatever, how many planetary scientists do you think there are? They think there's thousands and thousands and thousands, like a whole, you know, millions of them, right? Because they think there's a whole bunch of us. We just, each of us very loud. <laughs> okay. So what's interesting though, and this is why we could, before we did this survey in 2011, we had no idea what the number was, which is pretty important if NASA is going to be employing people to do research. Uh, and so we had to go to the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, of which I've never been to. It's a bunch of geologists, right? And I don't go and hang out with them. I go to the AGU. Yeah, of course I do. That's my, my, those are my buds. And then DPS, you know, I also go to the DPS. And so you can see that there's a lot of overlap between these organizations and so unless you do a, a really good well-studied uh, sort out people and where, where they um, uh, they belong you're not going to work out the total number of people in the field okay so this is useful for getting a sense of the workforce uh, PhDs working in these fields and uh, here are some actual numbers from uh, over the years the Astro top left uh, space physics here and uh, space and solar there and what we're looking at is the number of PhDs produced per year 
and um, there's sort of big range going on in here and um, you'll see that in as astronomy the number of PhDs produced in the US is about 250, that's that number up there, top left. Um, solar and space physics is about 62 and in planetary it's about 65. So those are the PhDs coming out of these various graduate programs um, in, in the US. Now this is a um, Fred, did I see that right? It's only about four or five in space plasma. Okay, so uh, heliophysics is this one that's red, and that is about four or five, yes. In space plasmas, the number is, yeah, is really low. But if you look at magnetospheres, is is blue, and uh, ATM, ionosphere, thermosphere, magnetosphere, is really quite high number up here, right? That's like 25, okay? Uh, and solar is here, it's gone up and down. Now I presented this at the CSSP um, meeting and uh, we wondered whether or not this increase in solar physics was related to the, to the um, development of faculty positions. There was a new uh, campaign to get a lot new, more faculty in solar physics that happened back in here and so yeah there's a bit of a delay and that may be related to that. Okay, so um, Travis Metcalf did a nice study back in 2008 looking at the, um, if you look at the jobs advertised uh, divided by the number of new PhDs, you can see that um, there's a lot of jobs per PhD coming out. Postdocs, there's a whole bunch, one and a half per PhD coming out. But if you look at the faculty jobs advertised, what you find is there was a period here in the 90s where it was one faculty, faculty for four PhDs. Currently now it's around one per two PhDs. And so that means, not surprisingly, not everyone getting a PhD is going to become a faculty member, which I think everybody knows, but we never talk about it. Uh, here is an example from solar and space physics. If you take the number of PhDs per year and you get the number of um, what you find, you look at the faculty positions, that it's, again, it's actually uh, a much, uh, uh, there's a larger number or fewer faculty positions in this field. And that may be related to the way that the demographics of the field, um, there was a big burst back a few years ago those are all retiring and there may be another one coming out, another burst. This is 2010, so it's eight years out of date. So, But this gives you a flavor of what's going on. You look in the planetary jobs for PhDs in planetary. They tend to be the, the dark here. These are university positions. So this is planetary scientists who are acting in, uh, doing research in planetary science. Here are people who are doing science and engineering. Uh, these are non-planetary scientists. So they've gone into management or something like this. And you can see um, there's a variety of different kinds of jobs there. Um, but the point again is that of the PhDs that are produced, um, uh, a relatively few number of them are actually going to end up, or a smaller number are going to end up in faculty positions. Fran, on, on your last chart, yes, is, is that uh, positions held or positions filled? These are when people answered the survey in 2011, they said that was what their job was. Okay. Okay? Yeah, good point. Um, okay, so it's kind of interesting to go back, this is back to 1900, uh, total number of PhDs in physics, and you can see some big bursts. Gee, I wonder what happened here? <laughs> what happened here? Apollo. Sputnik and Apollo, right? Provoked a lot of, of work, and then the decline in the 80s. Everybody went off to go work on Wall Street or something, I don't know. And they went up again, they went down again, another Wall Street burst or tech bubble or whatever it is. And now we're up at about 1,800 uh, per year, 1,200, this is in, in 2012. Um, what's interesting, I'll just pass over this, it's a sort of statistic they show at, at in the AIP. Number of years to get a PhD, the average is six, quite a lot takes seven, occasionally there's nine plus. And Nick Schneider is out here somewhere. <laughs> He'll admit it. He took his time. 
Okay. Uh, but again, just to really emphasize this, if you look at, this is in physics, the number of jobs uh, per PhD coming out. Uh, again, there's a lot of people who don't go into academic careers as um, faculty members. And so we need to have non-academic career advice. Uh, you, it's no good coming to me for career advice outside of academia because I've only worked in academia. But last as a whole, we need to be providing better career advice for non-academic people. Yeah? yeah? I want to respond to that a little bit. I often hear this actually. Coming up currently in the programs, it feels like you'll never get a faculty position, you'll never get a faculty position, look somewhere else, look somewhere else, look somewhere else. And I feel like I don't get support in terms of what if I ah, do excellent. want faculty positions. Because okay. I do really bad. Okay. I don't get support. Okay. You and I are going to run a panel discussion here at LASP <laughs> where we talk about this, okay? Good, let's do it, okay? Make it happen. Bully me. <laughs> Bully me on that. Yeah, Glenn. I think this career advice may be a clue of why some of these countries in the Middle East and uh, Asia have so many women is because the men are not being encouraged to go into physics or encouraged to go into right. engineering where the prestigious jobs are. Yes, so, so along with this is the issue that the international market may be related to the fact that People don't see being a physicist as very prestigious, and the guys go off and make money, or they become engineers, or, they, or entrepreneurs, or whatever. Right, no, I agree. So, um, I, good point. Okay, so we're, um, we, we do need to think about uh, academic careers. I would actually say that one in three and a half, or one in four, is pretty good. It's so a 24, you know. So yes, you do need to get career advice to, for you to get those jobs, um, but we also have to think about the other ones. I, I think that's very good. I tell people steady state is I have to produce one faculty member in my entire career. And those, that number of one in four is much better than that. Yeah, one in four is better than the average um, um, faculty member produces many more grad students. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, but I'd like to point something else out here. Physics education, the input to the professional, and also the training of people for the national workforce. And uh, on the, the first one over on the left here is um, total physics degrees per academic year. And this is 2012 to 13. We'll come back to these numbers. But you can see it's about, um, here it says 7,000. 7, um, total physics enrollments in classes, and you can see there's a lot, 12,000, 10,000, 15 graduate classes, 1,000 people in graduate classes. Uh, and then in, in institutions that don't have graduate programs, um, there's many institutions, here we have nearly 500 institutions across the nation that offer a bachelor's degree in physics. And so the point here is, that service teaching, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, or maybe people take it to be that way, but it's really important job to be teaching physics throughout in our, not only the research universities, but in the um, uh, non-research universities, um, helping uh, people understand physics and the world around them in a variety of different ways. So this is a really key thing uh, uh, for our profession. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the leaky pipeline. And people don't like the word pipeline because it sort of suggests sewage, doesn't it? So no, we don't like the idea of there being a pipeline. Uh, so you could take maybe, you know, a, a triangle with worker bees and top brass, if you like. Or you can take a tree of life with, you know, people going off into different branches. Um, I actually think that the pipeline isn't a bad uh, analogy as long as you realize that the pipeline is multi-branched. People go off in different areas and maybe come back in. Join the pipeline, there's, it's a multi, a multi ducted um, pathway pipeline and we need to think about uh, it this way. But, but when, we, when we look at the career, professional career, and here is the academic career, we'll come back to non-academic careers in a minute, where you think about how people choose physics. Now this was produced by Rachel Ivey of the AIP back in 2003, I think it was. And she, what she does is she takes the percentage of women 
uh, with 50 being in the middle and showing um, the percentage of women and the percentage that are guys through high school, bachelor's, PhD, assistant professor, associate and full. And what you see here is the pipeline is differentially leaky in these uh, early years. Okay. Now what the, what the uh, red line is, is what if you were to take the production of so many years before and move it forward? That would be the pr prediction of what the percentage would be. Okay, I don't find this an easy way. I found another way of doing it. This is the way I did this back in 2004 and published in Status, uh, the, the Status on the Women in Astronomy journal. Uh, and this is what I did. Okay, so let's just deal with physics on the left. You take the number of bachelors from 1966 through to 2000, 2006, and the blue line is the number of bachelors, the percentage of women. Then you move it forward six years, because that's six years to get a PhD, right? Then you would predict, if you move that forward, that you would get this green line here. Whereas, in fact, the number of percentage of women getting, a percentage of PhDs going to women is in the red line. So you can see that bachelor's to PhD is differentially leaky, right? Now, when you go Right, okay, so 13% predicted by the pipeline, when in fact it's 13%. And these are the numbers for astronomy on the right. Now, uh, and you can <laughs> come up with your pet theory of why this is, okay? And there's lots of ideas of why that would be. Now, when you look at uh, the faculty level, things are actually a little better. The top one here, uh, left is physics, right is astronomy again. And then we have PhDs, percentage of PhDs, in physics going to women, and you can see it's been increasing, okay, and there are some more recent numbers shown with stars, and then you take the associate professors, you move it forward somewhere between 13 to 17 years, so you've got a, a, a green line which is that width, saying, you know, it takes a while to get to that point, so you take the PhDs and project it forward, the actual numbers, which are these stars, are actually higher. Okay, so therefore we can say that from PhD to associate professor, the pipeline is not differentially leaky. Okay, and the same is true of full professors pretty much. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of reasons why people say um, there are, the pipeline is leaky or why there are fewer women or why there aren't women in the earlier years. And this is from Meg Urey, who was, um, uh, she's a Yale professor of physics and she was uh, president of the American Astronomical Society for some time. And she and I have been working together on this topic of demographics for some time. And she points out that if you look at, you know, a lot of people say, oh well, women, they go off and they have babies. You know, this is actually what the, when I challenged a Norwegian colleague about this, this is what he said. Oh, they go off and they have babies. Of course, in Norway, you have five years of, of uh, parental leave. And then coming back after five years out is not going to be easy, especially if the guys have closed all the doors, right? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, depending on your culture, uh, it may or may or not be an issue. But in the US, um, it, it doesn't look like this is statistically an issue because it looks like women who don't have children, like me, who chose not to have children, I don't necessarily do better than the women who do have children. Meg Yuri has two kids. She's done really well. She's in the National Academy. She's written a gazillion papers. She's at Yale. So it's, you know, okay, those are two examples. Okay, 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 I understand. But actually, if you look statistically, you'll find that these issues are, are, are not, not such a value. So the issues are, is it that the, the, the pipeline is leaky earlier on, or you know, is it culture? So let's deal with the first, and then we'll come back to the second. So this idea of a leaky pipeline, I came across this diagram back in 1988, when Sheila Widnell, uh, who's uh, from MIT, aerospace engineering, um, she, in her presidential lecture to the AAAS, uh, presented this diagram, it came out in science, showing that if you start off with four 
million 16 year olds, scary thought, um, <laughs> in 1977, and then you project forward what happens to them from being sophomores uh, through to graduating from high school and going forward, what you see there is, and, and the big sharp drop shows you where you have a big differential leak, uh, particularly between in high school. So back in this, this time, um, the big issue was mostly a drop off in, in the high school time, uh, but the net result of the two uh, million starting off, you have that one in a thousand women got a PhD in natural sciences or engineering, whereas five in a thousand uh, men ended up going that way. Okay. But at th that time, the leak was in high school. So let's look at the situation now and where we are. Um, we've come a long way at the university. So if we look here at a plot that goes from 1955 to 2000. 2000 will be a critical year, we'll come back to that. And we look at the blue line is the number of um, people getting college degrees, all bachelors, the blue line, and it's gone up now from a quarter of a million up to uh, 1.2 million. This is per year in the US, right? Numbers getting up, people are going to college. The number of physics bachelors, total number of physics bachelors is in red. And indeed, you can see that the Sputnik hump. But what's interesting is that this number is pretty flat. It's only gone up and down 20% around 5,000 in that time, which is kind of surprising, right? Now look what happened. 1999, students got the message, you can get a job. I wonder if this was when the New York Times published that physics is the degree that has the lowest unemployment on graduation. <laughs> I remember that plot. Um, but look what's happened, it's, it's doubled, right, since then. That's pretty darn good, that's great, it's wonderful. So this is interesting though. And, and if you look at all STEM, that's gone up. So science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, or medicine, sometimes say medicine instead of mathematics. I'm not sure which is the correct usage, but it could be STEM. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so physics, it's gone up. Right, good, all good, 2015. But, uh, and then also you look at the percentage of those who are uh, Hispanic American, and the number's gone up from 2% to a whopping 7%. That's a really low number, right? So, you know, but the number's going up. That's good. African Americans coming down. Not so good. So when we start talking about um, uh, ethnicity, racial identity, then um, there's a lot more going on, and we can come back and talk about this later uh, if you wish. But let's, let's, let's show what's happening with the women. And what's interesting is that over this period where the guys jumped up, where well, everybody jumped up, a big number, the women decreased a lot slower. And so when you look at the percentage of bachelors going to women, the number has been coming down for 15 years. I didn't realize this until last year, I don't know why. And I have no idea what's going on. So I don't know whether the number of PhDs is gonna drop down too, but something is happening. And it isn't just in physics. Look at all of these sciences, it's all happened. And all of the sciences and the engineering, you know, even earth sciences and, and biology and chemistry, which were high, but they've been dropping down. So something has been happening in the past 15 years uh, that is made this um, uh, an interesting problem. Okay, so computer science is a really interesting example, and it's sort of gone up and down and up and down, and um, that's another whole seminar in its own. Um, but I think the numbers are sort of in, they're pretty comparable to the rest of engineering, maybe a little far of engineering. But they, 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 that's a really complicated, actually, it's got 
that's a well-known, interesting uh, weekly plot. Yeah. Okay, so Sheila Whittle in 19, 1988 produced that pipeline and said the leaky part of the pipeline was high school. Now we see that high school, if we look at physics, which is red, is pretty 50-50, but college is down at 20. Bachelors and PhD, 20%. Uh, whereas chemistry and biology are maintaining their fraction of women. So something is happening, it's differentially leaky uh, for, for uh, women between, in physics, between high school and, and college. Um, so this is another plot showing the same thing, but what's interesting is it actually confirms my study from 2004 that if you go from PhD on to assistant professor, the numbers hold. So the differential leakiness is, it, is in undergraduate programs. Um, and just to show you that LASP is on a par um, to some extent, if you look at the PRAs, it's up at 22%. Uh, you look at the research, the RAs, we're at 20%, so it's comparable to the national numbers. Uh, tenure track faculty is below, this is low, maybe related to me um, becoming one of these instead of one of the very few of these. <laughs> but um, I know we are hiring. Uh, we will be hiring new faculty. I know we've got ads out, will be happening. Let's hope that this number bumps up. Okay. Okay, so this is a really, really interesting plot. And I'm going to talk you through it because it's really complicated. But I think it's very illustrative. It shows us some very interesting things. University of California in Davis, where they were studying a whole variety of different bachelor's degrees, and they asked the students coming in, or they had it recorded, what their incoming starting degree was in 2007. Okay? And there was a whole bunch of uh, different topics. And the two colored ones here, we have biology, which is this sort of uh, pinky color, and then the blue one is math and physical science. And then they, are, they found out where people graduated in 2013, and you'll see that only 20%, or probably less than 20%, of those that came in saying they wanted to do math and physical science came out with a math and physical science degree. They went to all sorts of other places. Biology, you know, more than 50% stayed in biology. Oh, and you can say, oh, they're all pre-med, they're going to go off and do that. Okay, fine. But what is going on here? Okay, so there's some major issues here related to um, what, what does this look like year by year? At what point, when, do the students drop out of physics? This is not gender, this is all of physics, right? Or all of science, but I'm focusing on physics. Do you have this for men and women separately? No. They may do, but I don't. Uh, again, that's a question. Why do they move, and what are the issues related to gender and minorities, right? We can do this. This is really easy for every institution to do. We, these numbers are all on computers, right? And the advisors and the faculty and the departments can go get those numbers, and they could probably employ someone like you to look at the numbers, because they don't have to be, they can be anonymous, right? So go tapping on the door of your department chair and say, hey, I would like to calculate these numbers for, for our department, okay? Summer, get paid over the summer to do it. Maybe even LASP. Hey, what do you think, Randy? Do you think LASP could sponsor somebody to do this? I think it'd be a great idea. Undergraduate, they're really cheap. Okay. <laughs> so let's do the research and find out. Let's not speculate. We can all come up with theories. Oh, this is due to this or due to that or whatever, right? Um, we need to find out what the numbers are. Okay, so then let's think about what happens when people graduate. And these are big, complicated diagrams, but let's just focus on this one on the left. This is 46% uh, of bachelors enter the workforce on graduation. Okay, and of these, 65% go into the private sector. Okay, and that's what these are over here. And you can look at these numbers, engineering, uh, information systems, gee, surprise, surprise, non-STEM, bunch of managers, or maybe they're digging dirt. I don't know what they're doing. But 
What I want to point out is this one, this grey thing there, when 9% go to high school teaching. That's a pretty small number, okay? And I was, was talking with the people at UNH about this, and we just did a little back of the envelope and thought experiment, and tell me, you know, see, if you, see what you think about this. Say you work out the number of high schools, and I think we did a Google search and it was 45,000 high schools, okay? What would it take to put a teacher in every single high school in the US with a physics degree, okay? So they can teach physics with a physics degree. So if you take 45,000 high schools, 15 years career length, I, that is kind of optimistic, putting up with working in a high school. I, I don't think I would survive 15 years, but let's just take that as a number. So you need 30,000 physics bachelors per year to go into teaching to do this, right? 3,000, what did I say? Whoops, sorry, 3,000, can't read my own figures. So currently we have 9% of 8,000, which is about 720. So we need to crank up this production by a factor of four if we want to put someone with a physics bachelor's degree in every high school in the United States. So this is kind of a shade, scary number, isn't it? So here in Boulder, I've actually been going around asking people who grew up in Boulder and in Denver area, the, the Front Range. You know, most of the high schools have people with a physics degree, right? They're usually the spouse of one of the researchers at the government labs that we've got all over here, right? Or whatever. There's, we've got a lot of people with technical training in the Front Range. So there's a lot of well-qualified people at the schools. But you go to a rural area in the United States, or a, a, a less wealthy part of the United States. You know, you know Boulderites? There are places in the United States where they don't quite have the money we have. <laughs> just, just wanted you to know that, right? Okay. Yeah. So I went to high school in Florence in Los Angeles. Right. High school physics teacher was an idiot. Yeah. Okay. So I think. Uh, okay. So so hands up, hands up. Who's been to a school where the teacher, physics teacher, was an idiot? Right. I I, I put my hand up. Yeah. Okay. There's a few others. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. I don't mean to. Th this is this is trivializing it. I mean the reality is we really do need to put. We need to be generating more physics majors and we need to put more into schools. Right. Now physics major is not easy. It's tough. It's a lot of work. Uh, maybe we need to think about a degree that's called natural science instead of physics. Physics is a bit off-putting, it's a bit scary. And what about having a little breadth, not just physics, right? Or maybe you have a, a degree in physics and education, so you, which I know um, Brigham Young University does this. I was talking with, with somebody about that who know, knows about it. And, and you even put placements into the local schools. So you get them trained. So you come out with your degree and you've got, you're qualified with your education training. You've got experience and you go straight into a school and can start teaching, right? And think, think of the impact that this would have on the nation. So it's not just about workforce for us here at LASP, wanting people to come work in our lab. We also need to think about the national workforce and how we need to be training more people um, uh, to go into high schools and teach physics and other areas. Do you have a number for salary differential between typical beginning position and High schools and, and what you get in So I have no idea for those numbers. I've only just started thinking about this issue of high schools. I would love to work with a see see what the numbers are. And there were probably people, maybe even people in this room who know from the physics education research literature about this. And I so I don't know that number. But uh, but you can imagine that a high school teacher does not get paid what an IT data analyst gets paid at Google, right? I mean we all know that. Okay, so this issue of uh, changing the name may be related to the fact that people tend to not think of themselves as being a physicist or a good physicist. Uh, and this is going to be leading into the cultural issue in a minute. Um, uh, so, so that's one factor. Uh, 
but but there are some issues about this differential leakiness that we need to think about. When I saw those statistics about how the numbers have been dropping, it got me thinking about a couple of books that I read in the late 80s, early 90s that came out uh, that were really looking at the issue of physics programs and how physics was taught at the university. And they're not done, they're different. Uh, it was a study that um, uh, looked at the, the uh, uh, interviewed and asked people, women particularly, why they dropped out of physics and a lot of it was, you know, their culture. They just couldn't stand it, hanging out in these physics lectures with some physics lecturer who was just putting them off and they go to labs and they were put off and they were like, why, why put up with all this? Um, then talking about leaving was uh, done here at the University of Colorado uh, by Nancy Seymour and, and uh, sorry, uh, Elaine Seymour and Nancy Hewitt and what they did was they said let's look at the reasons why women leave and what they found was the guys had the same issues with boring classes, chalk and talk, a lack of interaction, lack of explanation, lack of applications uh, and, and they were complaining it's just that the women left and the guys stayed right? Um, and so these are back from the 80s. Now physics Education at universities has completely changed since the 80s, right? They're much more interactive. I mean, CU has some of the best physics undergraduate classes in the world. They're really good at working at getting people engaged and involved and so on. So why is it that we have this problem where things are getting worse? We've got, we've, you know, I, are we going back to the same reasons that they had in the 80s or are there new reasons? why the women are, dro are dropping out of physics uh, and the guys too, okay? So we need to think about this. Um, it's not an issue of lack of math ability. <laughs> so this is really interesting sleep study that I read. I was talking with Noah Finkelstein about this. You can do these studies where you give a math test to men and women and if you write at the top of the math test, same math test, to everybody, just a regular math test, right? It's a math, math, math test, right? Math test, that's it. And you write at the top, this will be hard. <laughs> and you find the women do crappily, oh, sorry, don't do so well. If you write at the top, this test has been designed to be gender neutral. Same, same math test, exactly the same math test. Gee, the women do just as well as the guys. What are the numbers? 20 out of 100, 20 out of 100, versus uh, 10 out of 100. 10 out of 100 what? Score. S score. Score on the test. Okay. Sorry. I've also seen an article where you don't even tell them it's a math test. You don't even tell them there's a math test, yeah. <laughs> you say, hey, this is a piece of candy. <laughs> 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 yeah. So the question was, is there any reason why the guys did worse? Yeah, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I don't know. But, you know, I mean, what does it cost to write at the top of a test, this is gender neutral, right? I mean, tiny little piece of ink. I just want to say there's a lot of different interventions that you can do before exams. You don't just have to do this one thing. Right. There's been tons of studies right. of so right. just little right. bitty things right. you can do to frame yes. things. Yes. Yes, I agree. And I, I just wanted to show the one. But there are there's a whole research area that people have done. There's some very interesting things to be and actually CU is the research group, the physics education research group here has been doing a lot of this stuff. So this is one example coming out of our local uh, physics education research group. A total of three thousand six hundred students. So this is really statistically significant. That if you look at the male scores minus the women's scores in percent, then what you find is women do well in participation and homework. Perhaps not a lot of surprise there, but when it comes to exams and course grade, the guys do better than the women. So there's something going on with the type of assignment, the type of work, maybe uh, not doing well under pressure. And I think there's a lot of studies that show that if you're not a typical, a typical of the demographic of the people around you, you're much more sensitive to stress. And I suspect that's partly what's going on here. Yeah? On the last slide, do you know uh, how the results compared if nothing was written at the top? 
Um, there must have been a control test where they wrote nothing at the top, but I don't know what that number is. I'm sorry. Okay. But I, yeah. Okay. These are the extremes. Good point. Okay. So these, this is sort of showing uh, an issue of having to think about what's involved in taking these classes and what aspects of the classes appeal to different people and how can we help people study better. I did this, uh, so when we, when we think about our undergraduates going on to graduate school, um, we have to think about applications to grad school. And I did a study back uh, in 2003 and 2004. I took two years worth of applications to the APS department at CU. And I plotted up the physics and math GPA, all of the GPA associated with math and physics, so the um, uh, math and physics classes, and then I did the physics GRE percentile. And what you can see here is there's a big difference between the men and the women. They are, in fact, statistically different. The average is, is, is separated statistically. And you see a clustering of women top left. They're doing their homework and doing better. And maybe taking easier classes and not doing the quantum two and the special relativity and the blah, 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 all the tough classes or whatever they are. And then down right, you have the guys who either blow off their, their grades and take the tough classes. Uh, but then when it comes to the GRE, they just like, okay, I'm going to do it, crank it, and they do well. So, um, you, you know, there could be other reasons for these things, but it's worth noting these clusters. Uh, I will point out that the APS department no longer requires the physics GRE as of this year, was it this year? Yeah, major achievement. Okay, now we have to get rid of comps one in APS. <laughs> I tried for 25 years, and I'm sorry I couldn't make it work. Okay, so we all have reasons, but we need to look at the numbers and try and work out what is a successful predictor of success at, at, at graduate school. I don't think it's these, these quantities. Um, there are some studies we were talking about how to uh, improve learning gains, and there are all sorts of things associated with traditional lecture versus doing interactive engagement and so on. And these are the sort of things that, that Steve Pollack and his group have, and Noah Finkelstein have been publishing. There's a lot of studies here about how to make um, people realize that they're learning material and how to use it in a better way. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, the second one is the other one. Um, this is the one that I was talking about earlier. Um, and this is the one that I was and uh, she and I have been talking about, about issues of women in science for a long time. And uh, you do a Google on physicists and you find six out of 140 uh, women. So society does not uh, promote women, the image of women as a scientist. And then when you, you, you do look at other things, yeah, I mean, Hidden Figures has had a big impact. A really great movie uh, and, and probably made a big impact on aerospace, uh, the women going into aerospace. Uh, but then, for every Hidden Figures, you've got Big Bang Theory. <sighs> Total nightmare. Okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> and Bill Nye, who I... He's a nice guy, but I mean, how many scientists do you know have bow ties and a, and a lab jacket? I mean, really? Okay, and then you have, anybody can be a physicist, as long as you look like this guy. I mean, come on. Okay. So then there's a really interesting, there's a lot of fuss about inert versus, uh, or intrinsic knowledge or aptitudes, right? And you know, Larry Summers got into a lot of trouble for this. Um, but this is a really interesting plot from Science Magazine. This is not, this is, you know, serious magazine. It's what, what the vertical axis is percentage of US PhDs who are female, right? You've got a bottom plot and a top plot. This axis is means I think you need to be innately brilliant to be in my field, right? And, and so they interview a bunch of academics and what do they find? That philosophy, for example, to be a philosopher, you know, you really have to be innately brilliant. We all know that, right? <laughs> Physics isn't too far behind, math. I don't know why music composition is here. <laughs> Any ideas? I, I, 
Do they have a problem? I don't know, yeah. But I mean, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that there's this inverse relationship. And, you know, that's partly why I think we should change the physics degree to fun or uh, <laughs> natural science or something. Physics is just off-putting. Okay, so I'm now going to show you solutions. These are, these are some ideas, way to move forward. And, and again, like I said, think globally, act locally. And, and there's a bunch of things that we're going to be talking through. Okay, so let's start off with the undergraduates. We need to have, um, try and find out what the statistics are or why people drop out and ha at, at what point and, uh, and, and why. We need new statistics and we need to do some research. Um, indeed, more interactive classes, let's talk and talk. Um, using these aff affirmation exercises, like sort of writing these at the top of the exam. My personal theory, my theory, I need it, it is mine, <laughs> is that there's a sophomore road bump in physics, that you have these fun classes as a freshman, and then you hit classical mechanics, ENM1, all those sort of things, the more chalk and talk, you've got hard homeworks, and um, I think that's where a lot of people drop out. So I think what we need to do is that the universities, the departments need to pay the juniors and seniors to go hang out with the sophomores and help them with their homework. Help them get over that road bump and say, yeah, I studied with that guy, he was a pain. Um, and, and here's how we do the homework together. And you, I got over it, you can get over it too, right? and help people. And you can make a social environment where you study together in groups. So we've started to do that in Duane. They've got some study areas we could do with a lot more. Maybe have a place where there's a coffee shop and a bit of music or whatever. You know, let's, let's socialize our science, make it more fun, make it more interesting, and, and really encourage study groups to work together with a junior senior. Now, if the junior senior has to get paid to help sophomores with a homework, maybe they'll do better at the physics GRE themselves, right? So there's some, a dual advantage to this. Um, okay, so let's, uh, by the way, let me point out, you already know this, state funding per resident student, North Carolina, Buffalo, Georgia Tech, Maryland, Iowa, Michigan, Florida, blah, 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 which is the one at the end? Colorado, lowest of the low. Why is it that our, you know, this is a bunch of lefty state, right? We just, we just turn blue. Why aren't we putting money into education? Okay, never mind. Let's move on. <laughs> Where was California? Uh, you're right. It's not there. Where would you put California? Oh, these are universities. It'd be off to the right. Oh, I think it's I think it's way above Colorado. Colorado is way the heck down there. I mean, we really are down there. Okay. Um, okay. So we have to think about getting our students and do some career. Most important, I think, is. If the students are not going to go in, on in academia, we really need to work on this non-academic career advice. And we need to find ways to do it. And I would argue that our professional organizations need to do this. So if you are going to the AGU this December, go check out where they have sessions on career advice. Go sign up, go to these, these se sessions. And you, there are places, but they could do more, right? So, but I take advantage of them. Um, if you look at where people go, and so we've already talked about this, you know, a lot of people go, go uh, out of academia, so let's train people accordingly so that they, they're well equipped. Um, moving up to grad school, we have to think about recruitment, what are the, what are the indicators of success. Uh, we need to make a fair program, and again, we need to give non-academic careers. These are the sort of things that I show when I go to, um, go to universities and give advice uh, to departments. You know, we're doing their review, I've been in an external review on these sort of things, where they need to really um, think about how to improve the environment for their graduate students. <laughs> Third point is, not everyone needs to be a superwoman. 
So I pick out this from nature where they highlighted this woman. She does this, she does that, she does everything. And you look at this and you think, wow. I mean, high achiever uh, at MIT. Uh, it's a bit exhausting, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> trying to live up. So not everyone has to be a superwoman. Moreover, eschew the imposter syndrome. Everybody uh, maybe has come across this where they feel you're not really up to it and you're just uh, keeping going for a bit longer, but sooner or later they'll discover you. And uh, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't until I finally got tenure that I'm like, you know, let's get rid of this imposter syndrome. I belong, finally. You shouldn't have to wait that long, but it's common. It's a common thought. Two body problem. This is a really big deal that uh, it tends to be that uh, male scientists uh, hang, marry non-scientists, whereas female physicists and scientists tend to marry uh, or hang out with um, other scientists. And so we have a problem when we're trying to, to um, employ people. We have the same problem in planetary science here. Uh, so what there needs to be is a university-wide office for dual careers to help with placing the second person. We've got a serious problem with this here at CU and we have complete lack of help from the administration. The administration are singularly unhelpful on this. Uh, family, you could say ideally we should have a nationwide uh, parental leave policy like the Scandinavian countries but as you can see that actually does not help the number of women doing uh, sciences. So we need to think about a flexible system that um, helps women take time out to have kids and fathers to go, go hang out with their kids too. Um, we need to find ways uh, there. We need to have, have think of flexi flexible ways of doing this. So I should point out that those Scandinavian countries, the, it's the, they have requirements for men to, yes, to take time out. Take time out. But you know, the, there was a study of that at, at Berkeley, and do you know what they found? What they found was the guys, when they had the, the parental leave, they published more papers than those who didn't have the parental leave. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Whereas the women, it dropped down. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, so culturally, let's think about a few institutional things. Do not blame the women and tell them they have to be like men, right? I, I, you know, I've heard this many times. We have to think about a way of allowing people to be um, in, individuals. Um, and it's no good asking the women faculty to fix the problem. You won't believe the number of times I'm being asked to be on a committee because they want the token woman on their committee, right? And so the women have to say no. I have a blog on Wednesday yes, how to say no on this very topic. I will direct you to it if you're interested. Um, leadership from the very top is critical. Every single institution I've been to visit, where there have been issues, it's because the leadership have not stepped up. And Sopic said, this is important, I'm going to fix it. Uh, lastly, this is indeed my last slide with words. Um, there are going to be a bunch of National Academy surveys started up, decadal surveys, if you're involved in those, and several people here have been in them in the past. Um, they, there are, we need to do these and, and, and have the surveys, and the numbers involved in the decadal uh, studies. Finally, I will remind you of Hypatia of Alexandra. This is a problem that's been around for millennia, and there have been strong women in science for a long time. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. Sorry I ran late. <laughs>